Sweet Heavenly Father, as we gather this day, as we come to the place where we open up your word, Father, we praise you that you were willing to give your life for ours. What a glorious word and song. Father, may these thoughts, these truths, echo to the depths of our hearts. Lord, it may it cause us a greater desire to adore you, to surrender to you, to be used of you. Father, now as we come to the part where we open up your word, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can depend upon it as a truth without any error. Lord, that it is your inerrant, infallible word. Father, we hold and cling to the promise that you promised us that your word will never return forward. Use it today to accomplish your purpose, your will in each heart and each life that is here, whatever the decision that needs to be made. Father, give us ears to hear and eyes to see that which your Spirit has for us. We pray all this in the matchless, precious name of Christ. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. Ezekiel chapter 37. As you're turning, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of the historical context behind uh, what's going on here in Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel, a prophet, prophesied for about 22 years, starting in the 590s and going down to the 570s. He's prophesying to both a northern and a southern kingdom, mostly to the southern, but he's prophesying to two kingdoms, both of which are in exile. Both of which, because of their sin, their depravity, their rebellion against God and His commandments and His ways, God has delivered them over to the hands of their enemy, and their enemy has taken them away. In 722, the northern kingdom falls after having a succession of evil kings. Matter of fact, if you go back and study the northern kingdom, not a single king was a man of God. Everyone worshipped in the high places. And worship the pagan gods and denounce the ways of the one true God. And so in 722, 721, the Assyrian army jumped through and literally laid waste to the northern kingdom. Took them in captivity and as was their custom, the Assyrians, when they captured the land, they didn't just take all of Israel back and stick them in one little valley. They took them and they scattered them among the other people because they wanted them to deal with different cultures and different languages to keep from an overthrow taking place of their enemies. And so, later, the whole point of the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans were that the Samaritans were the northern kingdom that had been taken into captivity, and because of the way they had been scattered, they had been forced to intermarry because there was no one else to marry. Because they had separated the Jews in multiple camps. And so, uh, this... Syrians had taken them and had scattered them, and the northern kingdom had fallen. Later, because of the sin of the southern kingdom, now, mind you, the southern kingdom did have some godly kings, but they weren't near as many godly kings as there were ungodly kings. And if you go back and study Kings and Chronicles, you'll get this picture of, and this one followed in the way that his footsteps and did right, which was in the eyes of the Lord. And then you'll see about three in a row that did not follow in their father's footsteps and did not do what was right in the Lord, but did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so you have this succession. And as they go farther along, uh, there's periods of revival that peak because of a godly king, but those are few and far between. And after time, and after many prophets, and after many warnings from the Lord, Beginning in 605, God sends the Babylonians who had taken over from the Assyrians. And, well, they pretty much taken over the Assyrians. And in 605, began to lay siege upon Jerusalem and take them into captivity. Now this takes three major steps. There's five, or 605, I think 596, and then the final laying waste of the temple in Jerusalem was 586. So the Babylonians do it in kind of steps over a period of years. But in 586, the southern kingdom, or what we know as Israel, the two tribes that were left, the ten went north, the two stayed, were taken into exile, and they're in exile for 70 years. 
Now, the exile is the 70 years is not necessarily the time they were in the land of the Babylonians. The 70 years is the amount of time that they were not without an ability or were not without the capability of worshiping the Lord. 70 years is the amount of time they were without the temple, the tabernacle. They had no place to worship. They had no place to sacrifice. And so the years in captivity, as much as they were physical, there was also the spiritual aspect of it. They could not properly worship the Lord God as He had instructed them to through Moses as Moses spent the 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain because they had no place to perform the duties. Uh, they had lost not only the tabernacle, they had lost the pieces of furniture. Uh, the ark is gone at this point or in the process of getting gone. Um, and as the Babylonians come in and take over, the temple is laid waste. They plunder all the gold and all the things there. And I remind you, that golden candlestick, the menorah, was said to weigh around 90 pounds and was one piece of gold. Now, you imagine what that was worth then. Imagine what it would be worth now. They plundered the temple. Uh, they went 70 years with not a place to worship. Why? Because of their sin and rebellion against God. And so, as Ezekiel is prophesying, here, here's kind of what Ezekiel does. Please understand, he says, we're here... By our own making. This is nobody's fault but our own. We have no right to blame God. We have no right to blame the Babylonians. What happened to us is because of us. God pretty much told them. He's told us. Whatever a man sows, thus shall he reap. If we sow sin and rebellion and disregard for God's laws, we're going to reap chastisement from the Lord. And the longer we resist this chastisement, guess what's going to happen? The worse it's going to get. I mean, you know how it is. Uh, you've heard me share this story when I was a child, and the TV, and the spankings. Uh, I say there was ten of them. Dad says four or five. My high did felt like there was ten of them. I was put to bed. Didn't want to go to sleep. So I snuck out of my room, and they positioned the TV down the hallway where I could see it. And so I snuck out of my bedroom and just kind of was watching TV. Now, my parents never watched anything inappropriate. Remind you, even at that day, though my dad wasn't at that point, I was raised in a preacher's house. So there was nothing inappropriate, but they were watching one of those cop shows, and it was a little bit more graphic than me at four or five probably needed to watch at that time. And so I had been put to bed, my sister had been put to bed, and they were watching the show. And so I kept coming and peeking out. Well, I got caught, got put back to bed, got scolded, got back up, got caught. Got swatted on the hind end with my mom's hand. Didn't hurt near as bad as it probably should have, so I got back up. And after four or five times, I went from getting talked to to getting swatted with a hand to getting swatted with a hand again. I don't know if they used the third or fourth time. But finally, there came a fly swat. At that point, my hind end stayed in bed. But it took me, as my stubborn self, Four or five times. It was a progression. I didn't just heed the words of my mother. I tested them. And the more I tested them, guess what happened? The more they were up for the test. However, at a certain point, my hind end stopped being up for the test. And I went and laid down and stayed down. God is the same way with Israel. Just go read the account. He tried and He tried and He sent prophets. And He warned them. And He chastised them. And he warned them. And he chastised them. And so Ezekiel is saying, we're here and it's nobody's fault but ours. However, God is not done with us. There is hope. We have a future. And even in the midst of one of the most hopeless, helpless situations Israel has ever been in, in Ezekiel 37, God gives the people a word of hope. And the vision that he gives Ezekiel and what we know as the Valley of Dry Bones. And so we'll begin. Ezekiel 37, we'll read the first 14 verses of this chapter. The, land, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out of the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. And caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, 
There were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. He said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones. And say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and you will and will bring you up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and I prophesied there was a noise. And as I prophesied there was a noise. And behold, a shaking of the bones coming together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews of the flesh come up upon them, and the skin covered them about, above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus said the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, and it's seating great army. And then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, we are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. O my people, brought you up out of your graves. You shall put my spirit in you and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it saith the Lord. Now, over the course of Ezekiel's prophecy, again, we, we talk about 22 years. From chapter 1 all the way to the chapter, a few chapters on, I think 43. Ezekiel has several visions that God gives him. Matter of fact, the one in 43 is of the new temple uh, God gives him. This one and that one are what we would call apocalyptic in nature. Uh, they prophesy of a time yet to come uh, what we would consider the end times. And so, as most Old Testament prophecies, um, there's more than one fulfillment to most Old Testament prophecies. Now, even most New Testament prophecies. There's a shadow of an immediate prophecy, but that is just a shadow of the complete and total fulfillment which is yet to come. And so we've got to understand this aspect. There's more than one fulfillment of this. As a matter of fact, in this case, there may be two or three small fulfillments with the greater one yet to come, what we would consider the millennial kingdom yet to come uh, at the end of time. Um, and so, but in Israel's history, there are several times where God regathers them and puts them back in the land. Um, we think of when they come out of exile. There's three uh, movements where they go back into the land, they reset up the temple, and they begin to worship again. Uh, we think of the coming of the Messiah. Uh, again, He gathers them in. We think of in 1946 when Israel become a state. Uh, again, that fulfillment. However, the fulfillment greater here is the fulfillment that is yet to come in the end time during the Millennial Kingdom. When God will do what? He will gather His people into the land. And though He has set aside Israel for a moment, has grafted in the church, in the end times He will once again return back into Israel, is chosen, is loved. He will not leave them hopeless. He will not leave them helpless. He will return to them, and they will come to Him, and Israel, not as a whole, but as a most, will be saved uh, in that day and in that time. And so, in the midst of all that is being said here, understand this is a fulfillment that is futuristic in nature. Uh, though there are small aspects of fulfillment, uh, in a minor way, along the way. Um, and most, again, most Old Testament prophecies are constructed uh, that way. And so, as, let's just get again, we went over the setting, let's get again some of the aspects of what's going on here. This is a vision, this is not an actual event, this did not actually take place. Um, Ezekiel did not go anywhere, but God, uh, as He does often in the Old Testament, Give Isaiah, or Isaiah, Ezekiel, I'll get to our prophet in a minute, uh, a vision of something that was to come. And so in the Spirit, 
Ezekiel was drawn away though his body did not move from wherever it was when he said, the hand of the Lord come upon me. And so Ezekiel was drawn away in spirit by the Lord as the hand of the Lord was upon him. He carried him out in the spirit, out of the flesh um, of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Now, there's two aspects of this we need to understand. Not only is he being drawn away in the spirit of the Lord, secondly, we know we don't know where he's drawn away we can make a couple of analogies of probably what's taking place here. God has probably taken him to a place spiritually to symbolize a great military battle where someone was defeated, very possibly who? Israel. Now, not only is it possible that there was the military defeat, and again, this is all in the spirit, not necessarily happening in an actual historical event. There's two aspects here that we need to make sure we understand. It was an abomination, culturalistically speaking, to not properly bury someone that had died. Israel had a custom. We see it even when Jesus died. They would wrap them, they would anoint them, uh, they would put the great clothes on, the mat, the great uh, cloth over the head. They would lay them in a cave until their, their flesh literally uh, rotted to where there was only bones left. Then they would take the bones and they would put the bones in what they called a bone box. Uh, and so you would have this one cave. You would have two or three places to lay bodies, maybe four or five, depending on the size of the, of the cave. And then farther back, there would be boxes. And those boxes would have the bones of their loved ones if this grave was used by the same family over generations. And so they would wait. They would let the, the bodies rot. They would take the bones. They would put them in a box. And that was a proper Jewish burial. That was the culture in that day. So to symbolize a, a, bot, a, a valley full of bones that were dry, not only are these dead, these have been left. And so there's a, a hint of just indecency. A lack of dignity in, in the care of the bodies. Um, they were dry. They were dead. They were left in an indecent, immoral, culturalistically horrible manner. Um, and God uses these bones to picture who? The nation of Israel. The whole house of Israel. So what is God saying about the house of Israel? They're what? They're dead. Now why are they dead? Let's go back to what we talked about in the beginning. What do they not have anymore? They don't have a temple. They don't have a place to worship. And so from a spiritual standpoint, they're alienated from God. They don't have a place to worship Him properly. They don't even have the land anymore. The temple has been laid waste to. The wall is down. Remember? What does Nehemiah go back and build? The wall. What does Zerubbabel go back and build? The temple. It's laid waste. Jerusalem has been besieged. It has been taken captive. And so the, the nation as a whole, it is dead. Though not physically, they're in captivity. Spiritually, there's no place to worship. And so there's a hint here of, of these dry, dusty bones that have been left in an indecent and an immoral and an undignified way. Well, how do you think the Babylonians left the temple? Defiled. Destroyed. In an unholy, unconscionable way. They didn't go in. They weren't nice to it. They desecrated it. And it's all symbolic of Israel's sin and rebellion. And so as God takes Ezekiel in the Spirit, and, and notice what He says there, He caused me to pass by them round about. He, he shows him all of it. He doesn't just give him one angle. He takes him in the Spirit and He moves him about so He can see all the destruction, the destitute, the depravity, the indignant way in which they've been left and left there to just dry up and not bury in a proper manner. He shows them the extent to which they have decayed. And again, it symbolizes the moral spiritual depravity of Israel. As a nation, they are in captivity. Physically, more so spiritually. 
And so he asks the question in verse 3. As he says to Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? Now, when we look at Ezekiel's answer, uh, if you're not careful, you read in Ezekiel's answer a hint of doubt. Oh Lord, you know that that's not the case. When you look at that in Hebrew, uh, that's not the case. There's no doubt in Ezekiel's mind. Here's what Ezekiel's saying. Oh Lord, only You. You only. You know us. If it's going to happen... There's no other way it's going to happen but by you. He's not doubting the power of the Lord. Matter of fact, you see a hint of submission and surrender of Ezekiel recognizing the sovereignty and the power of the Holy God. Oh Lord, only you know. You only. If it's going to take place, I can't do it. The nation can't do it for themselves. Only you. Now, Here's one of the benefits of living in Southern Ohio. If you lived in a big city, this illustration wouldn't mean much to you. But since we live in Southern Ohio, it makes sense. How many have ever passed a dead animal on the road? Either some of you just won't raise your hands or you're just in denial. All of us have seen a dead animal. We live in Southern Ohio. You may have passed one this morning on your way to church. It happens. How many of you have ever seen that dead animal get up and move itself off the road? If you do, please videotape it. I'd like to watch it. Why? That which is dead cannot do what? Can't do anything. It can't help itself. It can't get out of the road. Why? It's dead. What can these dry bones do? They're in a destitute situation. They can't do anything for themselves. Well, what kind of situation is Israel in? same situation. Israel can't raise up. Israel can't do anything. Why? They've lost the power of God. They've lost the authority of God. Why? Because of their sin. And because of their sin, and because of their rebellion, and because of their worship of other gods as they try to worship, or try to mix the worship of Yahweh with the worship of these pagan gods, which is utterly um, an abomination in the eyes of God. As a matter of fact, remember, we go back, we serve a very jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so as they begin to synchronize these two together, uh, God becomes disgusted with them. And they are in captivity and there's nothing they can do to what? To change their situation. They're like that dead animal in the road. Because spiritually, God has done what? They have become castaways. Remember Paul prays in Corinthians? That he doesn't want to become a what? A castaway. He doesn't want to become useless in God's work. We may look at it this way. We, we, I, I preach this during the revival. We are called the light of the world. But what good is it when the church who is the light, we as the individuals, don't shine but put a bowl over the light? We become what? Of no value to the kingdom. It's like the salt that has lost its Savior. Israel has lost its Savior. Israel has lost its light. They're in a cold, dark place and God uses a valley full of dead, dry bones and He says this is the house of Israel. They have no what? No hope. No hope as they see it and no hope for what they're able to do. And thus, he goes back even and makes it more beautiful when Ezekiel says, O oh Lord, Thou knowest. Ezekiel says, Lord, we can't do anything for ourselves, but we know You can. Or Ezekiel says, at least He knows God can. And so, God um, obviously um, approving of Ezekiel's answer begins to tell Ezekiel to do what? Prophesy to these bones. And he begins to prophesy that the tendons and the muscles will come back on them and then the veins and the flesh. And so Ezekiel begins to do what? He begins to prophesy. Now what is Ezekiel prophesying to? 
a graveyard. Now again, it's in the spirit. It's not an actual event. But spiritually speaking, he's prophesying to a group of bones that Ezekiel understands he has no authority or no power to do anything. But he knows that his Lord can, and he knows that as he's been instructed to, it's his requirement, if you will, to be what? Obedient. The Lord says, no, I'll build an ark. What's no do? He built an ark. Guess what? It's never done. It's never flooded. It's never rained. I often wonder, and I've shared this with you before, did Noah have to ask God what a flood was? Maybe God told him what it was. Noah didn't know. He'd never seen one. He didn't know what rain was. It never rained at this point. But guess what Noah did? He built the boat. Guess what Ezekiel did? Prophesied of these bones. Now, how much sense does that make? Zilch. What good would it do any of us if we went out on our own and decided to prophesy to a local graveyard asking the bones to come forth? We're going to look like what? Complete idiots. But if the Lord says go do it, guess what we ought to do? Go do it. Because we can't cause those bones to live, but guess who can? The man that created them can resurrect them. He can bring life back to them. Oh Lord, thou knowest. You can. So when the Lord tells Ezekiel, as much sense as it didn't make, Ezekiel simply obeyed. Lord, you tell me to prophesy to them? I'm not even going to hesitate. I'm going to prophesy. Before he even got done, he began to hear the results of the work of the Lord. And those bones began to rattle. They began to shake. And those bones began to come together. And then the muscles and the tendons and the flesh began to come upon them. And there, as they gathered together, stood a, a valley that was no longer a valley of dry bones, but was a valley full of life. Well, no, what full life did? A valley full of bodies, dead bodies, probably standing, which would be kind of weird enough in its own right. And so, the Lord tells Ezekiel to do what? Prophesy. For the breath of the four winds to come to breathe upon these dead bodies. And so what does he think he'll do again? He prophesies. And what does he see happen? So I prophesied, verse 10, as I was commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet as an exceeding great army. And then he begins to tell them how the picture works. These bones are the whole house of Israel. They say that we're dry. Hope is lost. And we're cut off. Cut off from our parts. Probably it's used in two ways here. Cut off from our land, but also cut off from our ability to worship. We're cut off from those things. But here's what the hope of the Lord says. In spite of your hopelessness and your helplessness, in spite of the fact that you are a nation of dry bones, <coughs> I'm not done with you yet. I'm not done with you yet. There's going to come a day where I'm going to raise you up and I'm going to breathe the breath of God into you. Now, again, we understand this breath and breathe. Um, it can be translated in three ways. Breath, wind, or spirit. Now, obviously, we think we know which one that means. Who's going to bring life? He's going to breathe the Spirit of God on them, and they're going to do what? They're going to live, which gives not only the, the hope of future restoration, but it gives a future hope that in spite of your sin and rebellion, I'm not done with you. I've chosen you. You are my people. The things which I have promised you, they will come to pass. Watch. I am the Lord. I made a covenant with you. I will never turn from the covenant that I made. What did He promise them? He promised them they would inherit the land. Now, you go back under Joshua. 
They have never inherited the full extent of the land they were promised. Why? Because they were disobedient. They took most of it, but they didn't take all of it because they got satisfied with that which they had taken, and they did not completely expel the Canaanites and the Milikites and the Perizzites and the Hittites and all those other groups. But one day they will. One day they will inherit the land completely, fully. God will restore to Israel all the things that He promised them will be granted. There is hope for the house of Israel. Dear friends, please understand, you cannot separate from Scripture the house of Israel. It's all through the Scripture. You cannot interpret the end times without interpreting God's work in the nation of Israel. They were His chosen. He made a covenant with them. He will fulfill His covenant. So as much as we see a physical aspect of this, we understand that 90% of this is all spiritual. The restoration and salvation of Israel. However, when you look at this text, to me, I mean, this is just the way I read it, it's almost impossible to read this text and not have vivid just the vivid thought of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Dead, destitute, hopeless. Hope, life brought from the dead. Is this not a glorious picture of salvation? As much as it is a glorious picture of the, the hope and the future restoration of Israel, what a glorious picture of salvation. Consider the third of the three greatest miracles to ever take place in human history. Now please understand me and follow the logic here. Only one of these three are things that happen within man. The other two, and, and even the third one, it doesn't happen without God, but it happens in us, done by God. But the first two were completely done by God using human beings. And so the three greatest miracles rank very simple. Number one, the virgin birth. Listen, you can talk about the parting of the Red Sea. We can talk about the crossing of the Jordan, uh, the raising of the Lazarus, the raising of the dead. We can talk about all the miracles, the casting out demons and the blind and, and all that. Listen, one of the three greatest miracles, hands down, is the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. No way, shape, form, or fashion. However, again, it was not something done by man it was done for man by God. Thus Mary really had nothing to do with the miracle other than she was the one that the miracle was imparted to. The second one, of course, if we talk about the virgin birth, you can't go to the next one without going to the empty tomb. I mean, it's just illogical. Two greatest miracles ever in the history of mankind, even I think apart from creation, as great a miracle as it was, the virgin birth, and the empty tomb. Because understand, again, how long did it take God to create the heavens and the earth? Six days. Six days. I mean, He spoke of it, it took six days. He didn't have to, He chose it to. God wasn't wore out, He wasn't tired. All He did was what? Speak. And it was. It happened. However, when you get to the redemption of man, He didn't just speak it into being. And it didn't happen in six days, it took 33 years. And it began at the virgin birth. And it ended at an empty tomb. Salvation didn't come easy. Redemption cost. It wasn't something that could be spoken. It was something that had to be purchased. It wasn't as easy as creation. It wasn't easy as healing a blind man. It caused God to leave the glory of heaven to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life, to die on the road of the cross, 
the most horrific death known to man. The three days later, rising. Oh. Ah, it must be me. <laughs> this makes twice in the last week the last one I've preached. I'm hoping that's not a bad thing. I don't think I've said anything heretical in either sermon. If I had, probably it would not be the lights that went out. It may be my lights that go out. <laughs> but the, the cost of the salvation of man. The third greatest miracle is again a miracle all done by God. But it wasn't experienced by God. The virgin birth was experienced by God because God became what? Flesh. The resurrection was experienced by God because what happened? God, who became flesh, also became sin, even though he knew no sin. He was laid in a grave, and the third day he rose again. But the third greatest miracle is the redemption of man, to which God did not experience, because God did not what? Didn't he redeem? He's God. He's sinless. He's perfect. And when you look at the... And I think the third greatest miracle, um, unapologetically, unequivocally, I think even with a lack of being argued against. The greatest miracle, apart from the virgin birth and the resurrection, is when a lost sinner is saved by a loving God. Because you see the beautiful picture here in Ezekiel. Dead in trespasses and sins. Born at enmity with God. By our very nature. Children of disobedience. Sinners. No hope. What does he say? We were dead in our trespasses and sins. What does the word dead mean? It means dead. Let's go back to that dead animal. Has it ever moved itself? It can't. If it's going to get out of the road, somebody else has to do what? Somebody else has to move. Dear friends, when we're dead in our trespasses and sin, we can't save ourselves. No other human being can do anything for us. It must be a work of the work of God. And yet the Bible tells us, even though we were children of disobedience, children of wrath, even as others, but God, who is rich in mercy, hath what? Quickened. That's the word quickened there. They bring, it means to bring life from the dead. As God symbolically in the vision He gave Ezekiel breathed the breath of God, the Spirit of God into these dry bones as they took on flesh and they became a living, breathing army in the Spirit, so too is the act of God when a wretched, miserable sinner as we all are or were comes to know Christ. And through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, when we repent, the breath of God is breathed into us and that which was dead in trespasses and sins has been made alive in Christ. And without that breath of God, we have no hope. But just like God did not do with Israel, He did not do with us. Israel deserved to be left helpless and hopeless because of their sin and rebellion. And folks, we don't like to admit it. But because of our total complete depravity. We deserve hell for all eternity. We didn't deserve hope. We didn't deserve salvation. We don't deserve eternal life. We don't deserve a glorious inheritance. But just like God refused to give Israel what they deserved, He refused to leave us in our lost estate. And so He offered us a life. A way that cost His Son very dearly. A way that can breathe life into that which is dead. And just like Ezekiel prophesied, can, can these dry bones live? He said, Lord, thou alone knows. Dear friends, if these lost sinners are going to find life, it's only going to be through Christ. There is no other way. Only through Christ. Only through His shed blood. Only through the new birth experience as they turn from their sin and they accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Only 
then can these dry bones live? It's not a work that we can do. We, the church, can't say it. The preacher can't say it. Mommy and daddy can't say it. Godly friends and co workers can't say it. Only Jesus can say it. Only Jesus can give life where there is no life. Only Jesus can bring life from death. Only Jesus can make these dry bones live. Now, church, here's where it comes down to you and I. We need to be standing up and be willing to speak and to prophesy like Ezekiel was willing to speak and to prophesy. Only God can make the dry bones live. You and I can. But notice what God did. Did God need Ezekiel to make the dry bones live? Did God need Ezekiel to prophesy? But God chose to do what? He chose to use Ezekiel. But Ezekiel had to have the faith to know that one, only God could, but two, to know that if God chooses to, that He can. Ezekiel, in the Spirit, in his vision, saw a mighty work of God, but it did not physically take place. And church, here's where I think we've missed it completely. Do we realize how blessed we are that the sovereign God of the universe chose to give us the privilege of being involved in seeing a lost sinner receive the breath of life, the new birth of Jesus Christ. It is the greatest miracle that can be experienced by man. We will never experience the virgin birth. We'll never physically experience the resurrection, though we do spiritually. If we experience new birth. You see, the only way to experience the power of the resurrection is to do what? It's to be saved. Otherwise, there is no power of the resurrection in the life of that person because they're not a believer. And yet, we, the church, have the, the command and the privilege and the obligation to prophesy those dead in sin. That there is a way that their dead hopelessness can receive the breath of life and can be given hope. Hope in Jesus. And yet, I've shared this statistic with you probably a hundred times. Over the last four or five years, statistics bear out that 81% of people that claim to know Christ have never shared their faith with anyone. 81%. We have got the privilege of being a part of the greatest miracle ever experienced by mankind. To see a miserable, wretched, helpless, hopeless sinner have the breath of life breathed in them through a sovereign God as they receive the gift of salvation offered to them by Him. We have the chance of being a part of that. And yet, we only have that chance to be a part of that if we do what? If we prophesy and tell those bones that they can live. And they don't have to stay the way they are. And they don't have to remain helpless and hopeless the way they are. I've often said, and we'll close here just a moment, that I would have loved to have seen the ark. I'd love to see the animals fall in. I'd have loved to have seen God's hand of protection as He allowed that ark to float in the midst of the utter chaos and destruction of the earth and dirt. I'd love to be able to fly on the wall in that lion's den when Daniel was protected by the sovereign God. I'd love to be in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and experience what it's like 
to be placed in the midst of a roaring blue hot fire <coughs> and to not even be singed at all. Oh, can you imagine? I'd love to sing a wall of water at the Jordan and across the Red Sea. Just to see that. And I wonder, could they see the fish back in there and not allowed to go any further because there's no water? I mean, can you imagine? Could you imagine the horrific awe when that wall of water craved down, caved down on Pharaoh's army? And just took those chariots and just tore them apart and washed them. Killing the entire army. I love to have been on the road to Emmaus. To have been there at the empty tomb. I love hearing the story of the virgin birth as Mary tried to explain it to her mom and dad and to Joseph. I love to have been there. I've had mean, an awesome experience. But as great and majestic as all those miracles are, to see the man at the gate called beautiful leap and jump, to see the joy when he was able to walk into the tabernacle and the temple proper and worship the sovereign God of the universe who had just given him his legs back after he had never walked before. To be there when someone that was blind from birth was able to see for the first time. I watched a video on Facebook the other day of a, of a, of a young boy that was born deaf. That because of some medical uh, ability that God gives somebody, they gave him the sound to hear was something they, they surgically implanted or put on his ear. And, and to see that boy's face when he heard his mama's voice for the first time. Oh dear Lord, what a miracle. Yet none of them even began to come close to the glimpse of glory that we have the ability to be a part of when we prophesy to the dry bones and we see them come to Christ as Lord and Savior. There is no greater miracle than a miserable, wretched sinner finding safeness, eternity in Christ. Nothing. Pick the building up and move it wherever you want to move it. Cast them out into the sea. They pale in comparison to a child of sin becoming a child of God. And yet, God gives us the privilege of being a part of that. And I asked myself this question this week as I, as I studied and I reflected back on my own uh, personal witness and lack thereof. Why then do we not prophesy to the bones? Why do we not share? Why do we not share the greatest message and the greatest story? Knowing that whether or not they get saved is between them and God, it has no bearing on what we do or how we perform. It's not of us, it's of Him. Ezekiel didn't do anything. Other than do what? What God told him. So let me ask you a question. When are you and I going to begin to do what God told us? What did He say? Go ye, therefore, when it, therefore be convenient. No. The, the actual literal Greek translation is as you are going, make disciples. Not when we choose to go. Not how we'd like to go. When we go. From the moment of new birth to the moment of beholding our Savior face to face. As we go, we're to go sharing the Gospel. Knowing that we're a part of the greatest miracle that a person can see and experience. And 1 Corinthians tells us it doesn't matter for the one that planted, if for the one that watered, or for the one that reaped, we're all one in the same. And the one that reaped will not have any greater reward than the one that sued, sung or the one that watered. The reward will be what? The same. Because we all did what? Prophesied the dry bones that they may live. Never head down there, right close. If those can lead us in the end of the Child of God, 
the last time you prophesied with grandma? When was the last time you shared your faith? And do we, do we realize how sad it is that so many have never experienced the joy of seeing someone that we've shared the gospel with come to know Christ? If salvation is the greatest miracle on earth, and I swear to you it is, then those of us that have a hand in seeing that process take place, how greatly will God bless us if we prophesy in our obedience? Blessings we can't even begin to imagine. And if God is blessing us, and we're a part of the church, and you can't be saved without being a part of the church, then how blessed would our churches be if the people that make up those churches tell others about Jesus? We all say we want our churches to be blessed. We all say we want our lives to be blessed. And yet the greatest blessing that a church can receive and the greatest blessing that we can receive is prophesying to the bones and trusting God to take care of their lives. He never said our blessings will be based upon what decision they made. He said our blessings will simply be based upon our obedience in Him. Whenever we sow, thus we shall. My question to you, church, is will we come together united? Not just united in doctrine, but unified in mission and in purpose to share the gospel, to prophesy to the dry bones and tell them that they may live. That's a decision we each individually have to make. But I can promise you, though we will be persecuted, and though there will be obstacles, if we will share, we will tell, we will prophesy, God will bless beyond measure. Us and His church. Dear friend, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me share with you the greatest act of love ever known to mankind. When Jesus gave His life for you. He loves you that much. But He left heaven's glory to give His life for you and for me and for all mankind. And today He offers to you eternal life. He offers to you the opportunity to be adopted into His family. To have your sins completely forgiven. Have them washed as white as snow. But it is a gift you must receive. Will you today receive this gift? Father, we love You. We thank You for Your Word. Father, we thank You that for those of us that in Christ we've experienced quickening power of the sovereign God. Father, may that joy that is unspeakable cause us to share this with others. Take this invitation, O Lord. Use it for the expansion of your kingdom and for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Standing as we sing with them. 598. 598, the altar is open. I'm down front. <coughs> if you need to come, the Spirit moves. <coughs>